So hi everyone, thanks for making it today. Uh, this is another in the series of Sea Ice Talks as part of the IGS Global Seminar Series. Uh, if you haven't joined before, we try to do a Sea Ice Talk about once a month. Uh, the seminar series takes place every week, uh, Wednesday afternoon for those of us in North America, Wednesday evening in Europe, and I believe Thursday morning uh, across the Pacific. Um, this week, we have two exciting talks. We have Sean Chua and Anton Steckety from the Australian Antarctic, Ar Antarctic Division, sorry, and Australian Antarctic Partnership Program. Uh, they're going to be presenting on a new online platform that they've developed called Nihilus. Uh, it's a mapping platform to look at sea ice around Antarctica. And then we have Andy Mahoney from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, who's going to present on a project titled Ikavik Sukukin, Bridging the Scientific and Indigenous Communities Understanding of Sea Ice in a Changing Arctic. Uh, so a bit of a mix here. We've got a first talk that's going to feature a lot of remote sensing and online interpretation of data. Then we've got Andy's talk that's going to connect sort of um, modern Western science with local traditional knowledge and how both of those knowledge systems are seeing changes in the Arctic ice pack. Uh, as per usual, we'll split the seminar in half, so each speaker will have half an hour and I'll ask that we save questions until the end of the two talks, or sorry, we'll ask questions for Anton and Sean after their talk and then we'll save questions for Andy till the end of his talk. Uh, you can use the raise hand function at the end or drop your questions into the chat and I will get to them there. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Anton and Sean. Ah, there we go. A quick hello, plug. everyone. Uh, cool. My name's Anton. This is Sean Chua. Hi. Um, we're just going to turn our video off and hope that it helps our cause um, and share our screen. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, so uh, Anton just put a little message in the chat uh, if you feel like opening our site. It's called nylas.org and it's a browser based tool to explore remote sensing products in the Southern Ocean and the Antarctic sea ice zone. So that's me on the left and Anton on the right, obviously. And um, we both work uh, at the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Science and for the Australian Antarctic Division. Um, we've got kind of remote sensing and climate backgrounds and but are new to um, the kind of cryosphere type research. Um, and so kind of brought a, maybe a little bit of a different skill set to some of the uh, other, some of our colleagues. Um, so I just want to talk about why we built this tool. Um, you know, our goal was to create, or was to create a tool to support scientific curiosity, voyage planning, buoy and float deployment, um, and make sure it was made in a way that was readily accessible. Um, before we did this, we spent quite a bit of time working on trying to work out what the existing platforms are, because there's so many, you know, ways to um look at ci starter and for people of different backgrounds um this can be really like you know it can be confusing and why would we want to add another platform um so first we looked at polar view um which was great uh and it's it had a little bit more of a focus on downloading data um and generating these kind of pre-made plots um than what we were looking for we were kind of looking for more in situ interactivity and visualization we also looked at NASA Worldview. Um, so those are browser-based tools. Uh, we also looked at kind of uh, Python or um, coding-based tools for visualization and analysis, such as IPy Leaflet, LeafMap, and R Leaflet. Uh, these were all great and quite powerful. They required a bit of minor fiddling in order to work with Antarctic projected data. But in the end, they were kind of a bit too technical for our target audience. 
Um, so kind of after we had a look around and realized that there wasn't a platform that was doing what we wanted to do, uh, we kind of set out some goals. Uh, these were making sure we made something with an intuitive user interface. Um, you didn't have to download any software and you didn't need any specific skills. Um, we also spent a long time choosing the data sets that went into Nihilus. We did a bunch of community consultation, including with some other people that are in this uh, meeting now. Um, and we wanted to pick the best data sets that experts suggested to us without being beholden to a particular, you know, the ESA products or NASA products. Uh, we just want to have like a mishmash of what the community was using. Um, so if you, if you feel like it, I'd encourage you now to open a web browser and go to nylas.org, um, just cause it's much easier to explain what I, what we're talking about. If you just have the site open, um, there are 17 data sets in total, uh, split into categories. Um, so we'll open nylas now. So if you're not uh, following along, you can look at the shared screen. Um, there we go. Um, so yeah, 17 data sets in total split into categories. We've got sea ice concentration, sea ice extent, freeboard, timing, chlorophyll, sea surface temperature, and other. And there's good stuff in other actually. I think. Uh, um, so we've got a variety of resolutions and if you want to know more about a data set you can click this little eye on the right um, and that'll tell you about the time range the underlying product the papers that we use to create um, create the data set etc and so when you load in a data set just by clicking the little checkbox, um, you can see how it changes through time by using the calendar. Um, so the calendar is just at the top there and Anton's kind of being my controller at the moment. Um, and so if you want to look at January, you can click that. And so we're looking at 25 kilometer um, sea ice concentration at the moment. So, you know, this interface we hope feels pretty easy to use. And yeah, you can also use the arrow keys uh, to scroll through uh, months, years, and you can load up and stack multiple data sets, change the opacity, um, and scroll through time. And you can also click on a particular pixel. So if we let's go to the, the Weddell C maybe or something. And um, if you zoom in a little bit, yeah, you can you can get the exact values. So here we've got the freeboard and the sea ice concentration uh, percentage. And there's no real limit to the amount of data sets you can stack, but you'll find that it's pretty hard to interpret if you put too many of the same uh, over the top of each other. Um, it does, yeah, the, we don't have a full, the calendar goes to dates because these data sets have uh, date ranges that are differing. So you can navigate to a date where there might not be any data, such as this freeboard product is from ISAT2, but that wasn't launched until a specific year. So um, if you go before that year, you obviously you won't get any data. Um, another thing we wanted to mention is that you can upload a vector file. Um, there's a button on the left, but we'll show that in an example. Uh, and that's that's a really that was a when we initially made this we sent it out to a bunch of people and asked them what they felt and that was something they requested so they could upload you know a ship track or something like that their own personal data and overlay it and kind of see the relationship with these different data sets yeah so we're just going to talk about next uh you know ex some examples about what we've used the tool for and what other people have found it helpful for. Um, change the screen. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so you've probably heard recently that there's a new Antarctic sea ice minimum in 2023. So this 
what from the, the NSIDC chart tool is a, is a good way to kind of show that. And you can see that uh, that blue line there shows the minimum CI6 stem. So we can also explore what this looks like spatially um, in the tracker. So we're going to pull up the monthly mean CI6 stent and the long-term monthly mean for um, February 2023. Hmm. So the, the solid lines here are the monthly mean for February 2023 and then the dash lines of the climatological mean so you can see that the it's it's fairly consistent around antarctica you can see that the cs extent is 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 lower this year in february 2023 the easiest way to actually look at the differences is then to pull up the monthly anomaly layer instead so you can see pretty much there's consistently red areas for for low um for low CS concentration in February 2023 obviously caveated that February 2023 is still going on so there'll be a few more days and this will um update as the as the data becomes available we can also look at the connections of this kind of low CS concentration we can look at the connections of that to the to the timing of sea ice in 2022. Um, so yeah, if you just close the monthly anomalies and open up the duration anomaly, uh, the anomaly, yeah. And we'll go back to 2022. So in the bottom left of the picture, you see there is one area where the um, duration was longer than typical um, out, out from that Amundsen Ross Sea area. And the much shorter duration on the left, where that's that big red, like dark red blotch. Um, where the duration was much shorter than typical. But other than that, it's fairly consistent around Antarctica. You see um, the duration is less than typical, and you can sort of connect that with the um, low sea ice minimum in 2023. Um, and then you can also look at whether that was dictated by advance or re retreat. And um, mostly it's fairly consistent. Although that area we're looking at, we've got highlighted now, it did uh, retreat partic un unusual, like particularly early um, last year. Move on to. And so this is a, an example that one of our colleagues, Mark Mallet, actually used the tracker for. So he's been working with some data from a, um, a voyage in 2018. The Capricorn voyage, where they were sampling um, cloud droplet number counts. So they were sampling aerosols. And they found that once they got south of about 62 degrees south, they found this unusually high um, aerosol count. So the unusually high aerosol counts shown in this figure um, with, the, with the red line there. And that's the cloud droplet number count. Is, is higher than the kind of Southern Ocean um, mean they would expect. So in the tracker, we'll pull up the chlorophyll layer from February 2018. Um, and then we're also going to overlay the ship track on that to sort of see if we can see a um, sea relation there. And just go to geojson test data and then the top on there. Hmm. 
so this is this is the 60 degree south and so this line this area where they were sampling you can see there is a bit of a chlorophyll bloom um, to the east of it and if we open up the anomaly layer it actually also shows that that's an unusually uh, that was unusual for that area at the time so you can there's a big bloom sort of around where they were sampling but also uh, to the east of it there and so there's a possible connection there that he's been able to identify that um, the biological activity has been a source of the the aerosols um, leading to the high aerosol count they were sampling during that voyage and this data is not really that that easily accessible it would have other like without our tool he would have had to download it um and do, do the do a fair bit of analysis to kind of get to this point for for a, a, a conclusion that's maybe not core to the work he was doing but it was kind of nice um on the side conclusion so that's where kind of having the data more readily available was was pretty useful to him and um if you you can see if you upload one of these vector files we take a few formats um if you just mouse over you can see all the kind of metadata that's kind of encoded in there this is a particularly rich data set with lots of wind and radiometry salinity water temperature um, so it's nice to be able to in terms of the ship tracks you can you know it's got the date in there so you can line up the date um, and compare you know what what we're looking at these remotely sensed data sets from this in situ data um, but really you can put any any vector file in um, like if obviously it's it's best if it overlaps with our data sets in terms of the temporal and spatial region but you know you can we I put in a running gpx file the other day that showed up in Tasmania which is um not too far well, yeah, we're probably closest at the moment just for context, this is where this is where Anton and I are sitting right now, uh, presenting um, far away from you all. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's just two kind of examples um, of the tracker and or of Nihilus uh, and the uh, different kind of problems it can solve. Um, I wanted to just quickly talk, and this is maybe a little bit like uh, left of center of the typical uh, IGS, I guess, content about um, our vision for what we did. Um, so we um, made some educational resources in, so in creating NILAS, we ran into like a whole bunch of um, issues. It was really hard, like, things that should have been uh, simple were surprisingly challenging um, in terms of, uh, pro you know, projections and how the, you know, every, most of the geospatial libraries and data sets um, are really not designed to work with Antarctic projected data. And I'm sure you're all super familiar with this because you're all experts uh, in your own right. Um, and so we started creating some educational resources. Um, so we've made a blog post that Anton's going to pop in the chat. Uh, if anyone wants to follow along, you know, this all the code for this library is open source. And even uh, whatever happens to NILAS in the future, we really hope that um, the we can get some pull requests, uh, some code changes accepted into the parent libraries. Um, that we built this on because we used a leaflet um, is kind of what this is built on, uh, such that uh, for all of us, every time we want to look at um, Antarctic projected geospatial data or remote sensing products, particularly in the browser, it should, we hope it will become easier and easier. And we really want to like propagate the uh, open source nature of this research. And the blog post that Anton wrote is really excellent. It's got perfect little um, encapsulated examples. And um, yeah, uh, if you go to the chat or I, we can share the slides or an email later with a link to it, um, you know, it might not be up everyone's uh, alley, but uh, there's a few little nuggets in there that 
even if you're not creating a JavaScript web-based tool that might be a little uh, helpful for you in your own research if you're trying to pick apart some data sets and get them to look nice and play nice together on the screen. Um, so yeah, we really emphasize using common open source tools. I mentioned Leaflet um, and all the data preparation was to create these you know, spatial reference data files such as GeoTIFF, GeoJSONs, and we all just use uh, Python. So there's no um, nothing particularly fancy, nothing you couldn't access yourselves if you ever want to um, do something similar. I will note that we this is just for Antarctica, but if we meet a particularly passionate person that wants to do this for the Arctic, it wouldn't be that hard um, because the framework's all sitting there. Um, but we focused on the Antarctic other than it being a core part of uh, our job it also there's just a little bit less focus focus sometimes in these platforms um so that's actually the end of our talk we're a little bit brief um uh, we just want to know that's supported through the australian antarctic program and from grant funding from the australian government uh, as part of the australian antarctic program partnership uh, thanks for listening Great, thanks to both of you. Uh, we'll open it up to any questions. And I'd encourage people to check out the links that they dropped in the, the comment chat there. Uh, maybe while we're just waiting a sec, I had a quick question. Could somebody upload a ship track, let's say like the example that you showed and pull out sea ice concentration data and pull out the data from selected layers? Or is it more of just like a visual thing? So at the moment, it's it's pretty much a, a visual thing. And um, what you're talking about, we kind of, we undenied about how much complexity to add to it. But, you know, any suggestions we get in this chat, we are open to listening to. But we also have a, a pretty strong vision of kind of where we, where we want to take it, yeah. Yeah, no, interesting. It, it, I just always wonder about that. It's something I do personally in my research, uh, pulling out sea ice data from ship tracks or buoy tracks or different things like that. Uh, Andy, quick question for you. Yeah, thanks, David. And actually, I see Alec has got his hand up and my question partly might be covered by Alex. So I, I, I'm happy to defer to Alex because I'm going to be, everyone's going to be hearing my voice later on. So. My, mine was a little kind of random one. Um, I was just wondering about where you're hosting this and the, the challenges and the potential costs of doing that, considering potential users and the data sets that you're hosting. Yeah, so we're hosting at uh, NCI, so the National Computational Infrastructure. They're a research uh, supercomputer mainly um, in Canberra. So we kind of ended up hosting there just because we have a pretty strong connection with them. Um, our, you know, our, our project uses them for supercomputing and that sort of thing. And so we had a, an existing connection there. Like I'm not, yeah, not hundred percent sure that's the best way to go, but it was handy because we already like have our Python pipeline set up there and there's a bit of, uh, you know, they already replicate um, era five, and so we might add that in the future. And so there was a bit of kind of overlap there that that made that um, okay. straightforward. Yeah, I guess yeah. also, you know, this tool was finished um, a while ago, uh, but we only just publicly released it because we spent quite a bit of time getting a load balancer and like a few things like that to make it robust to. Uh, get quite a few users in because you know Anton and I have a we're science we have a science background not a web development background so we were treading a lot of like new paths as we uh worked on this project and so we were patient with the launch trying to kind of make it a bit more robust and official than right the you know just sending an IP address to a few people yeah right that was yeah, a good that seems then. like the the threshold of yeah actually attracting users because you know I've seen things like this before but when Things aren't reliable or crashing, then people just kind of give up on them, you know. But if if it, yeah, it seems like you guys have spent the time to make it actually be able to balance the loads and be, yeah, you know, the go-to. Yeah, we at least, exciting, yeah, yeah, we at least hope with um, 
if it ever does explode the uh, the you know at least the codes out there and people can um you know whatever lessons we've learned can be absorbed into the community right cool thanks guys great uh andy we'll go back to you did that cover your question or did you still want to go uh I, I guess I had a, a, a different question. It was uh, related to uncertainty and whether it would be possible to include uncertainty information about the data layers. And that was really triggered when you mentioned the phrase uh, exact value and you pulled up the, the ISAT free board, um, which the, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. So exact can really needs to be sort of paired with uncertainty. So that's where I was going. And I thought maybe uh, Alex might have had a comment about ISAT free board too. So that was why. I, I disagree with you, Andy. It's all perfectly certain. So. <laughs> I yeah, that's, that um, yeah, yeah. that's good feedback, and we'll definitely take that on board. I guess when I said exact value, I meant not just comparing the color to the scale, but getting the number. But the number itself has an uncertainty associated with it. And our hope, maybe that's something that we could include in the little info box. Um, we do have that for some layers but not for all of them and so um, i'll think about that in the future thank you there was a there was a previous prototype where we had um the significance of any like anomalies included and it sort of dropped off along the way but if if people think that that's useful then maybe we'll like it it, it does add a fair bit of data so um it, it's it's something we've thought about and then we just can't because i was going to like add a fair bit of complexity but we could come back to it for sure Okay, and uh, last question to Marin. Hi, thank you. Um, that sounds like a really valuable tool. Um, for someone who works mainly on fast ice, um, is this going to have higher resolution in the future or are you going to stay at the 25 kilometer pixel size? So we do, um, we do have some higher resolution in there. We just actually didn't use it as an example, which is um, probably mm -hmm. an error on my part. So we have this, our daily data uh, is the Bremen six kilometer resolution. Um, yep, the artist's I data know, set. Yep, I know there's yep. a three, there is a three kilometer, um, but we are not, we kind of didn't find it too much advantageous to add it. And it was also really big because um, the pixels are so yep. small. So we kind of, yep. we can get down to this uh, kind of resolution. I'm not sure that's, I'm a bit of a fast ass rookie, um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, would you in future add um, Alex Fraser's fast eyes extent data set to this? Uh, actually, uh, possibly. I mean, he sits next yeah. to me, so yeah. <laughs> uh, if he pokes me enough with a stick, uh, we could definitely get it in there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much, Sean and uh, Anton. That was great. I uh, again would encourage everyone to check out the links that they added in the chat and to play around online. And it sounds like if you do have some feedback or have some ideas, it sounds like maybe they would be open to some of that. So maybe they can drop their email address in the in the chat. And if anything comes up when people are playing around with it, they could they could send a message. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Really, really enjoyed that. Uh, so next, we'll go to Andy. I'll find the mute button. And then I'll find the share screen button. And Hopefully everyone's seeing the screen. And if I go, uh, are you guys actually seeing my presentation screen or are you seeing the notes slide that sometimes comes up? Yeah, we've got your presentation slide. Looks good. Perfect. Okay. Uh, hey, so greetings everyone. Those who don't know me, I'm Andy Mahoney. I am coming to you from Fairbanks, Alaska, which I just looked up is 13,000 miles, uh, 13,000 kilometers away from uh, Hobart, Tasmania. Uh, and uh, I'll be talking about Arctic sea ice and particularly I'll be talking about the Ikagvik Sukukun project, uh, which was an effort that I was very lucky to be a part of based out of Kotzebue, Alaska, um, where we uh, worked closely with indigenous experts to understand um, sea ice 
in Cuts of View Sound and, and, and how that uh, is changing and what those changes mean for local residents. Um, a lot of people to acknowledge here, and I'd like to begin first and foremost with our Indigenous Advisory Council um, uh, elders who volunteered, um, volunteered initially, but were, were, were uh, paid um, members of the team afterwards, uh, John Goodwin, Cyrus Harris, Bobby Schaefer, and Ross Schaefer. Um, and the other members of our research team, uh, I won't list them all here, but it's students and faculty from uh, Columbia University in New York, University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, University of Washington, um, as well as the native village of Kotzebue and uh, Farthest North Films. And we were funded by the Gordon and, Mary, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, who um, I'm, I'm really grateful for. I think they, they took a little, little bit of a risk in that they were willing to fund a project a research proposal that had no hypotheses to begin with. And, and I think that's uh, a big step and it's really important if you're gonna do knowledge co-production in, in a meaningful way. And I'll talk a little bit more about that now. Um, so this was very much a community-centered research project. Um, I've got this fancy box and arrow diagram on the right, which is the sort of thing that you have to put in research proposals. Um, but the key elements of it are that there is a, a, a circle of reciprocity between the community and the researchers and the science that happens. Uh, and it begins with community engagement. In our first year, we went to the community um, as, 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 a, as a team of researchers without any research questions, and we worked with local elders to decide what those community what those questions should be before we actually started designing our research program we then had back and forth with the community members uh, coming up with the science plan evaluating that um uh, carrying out the research doing, um, and then sharing the data back with with the community and around all of that we uh, were lucky to have a documentary video, a documentary filmmaker um, filming us so that we could tell our story and share that with the community in a way that's actually a lot more compatible with oral history traditions. Uh, we wrote some papers and we were very pleased with those papers, but also I think the, the video documentary that we produced uh, was really the, the, the keystone of the whole project. Um, and I'll begin with a very short documentary, a very short clip we produced at the beginning that shows what the early stages of our project looked like, what the first year was like when we visited Kotzebue, some of us visiting Kotzebue for the first time, meeting with uh, elders and, and local experts from the community to start coming up with uh, the research ideas for this project. And, and we literally started with a blank whiteboard, you can see in the background there, we poured over maps, we shared stories, we drank a lot of tea and coffee. And over time, we started filling that whiteboard with questions. Um, and it was incredibly enjoyable experience, honestly, really getting into it, getting down into the details with a very, very knowledgeable group of people um, who don't necessarily look at the world around them in, 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 in the context of hypotheses. So I think we were both learning a, a lot about what was going on. They were learning about how we look at the world and we were learning how they look at the world. But the shared goal was understanding the CS of Kotzebue Sound uh, and what that means for locals. And you really can't talk about CS with uh, Arctic communities without talking about marine mammals, shorebirds, the wildlife, much of which is uh, important subsistence food resources for, for these community members. Um, I think we're, we're looking at the stomach contents of, of a, a bearded seal there actually, um, and just the, the, the kinds of information that you can draw about a system when, when you know in all the right places to look. So I'll, I'll, I'll let this play through. Um, it was one of those experiences where earlier in my career, I'd, I'd 
had uh, meetings like this and I kept feeling like, well, when's the work going to start? When am I actually going to start measuring something and writing things down in my field notebook? And it's taken me some time in my career to recognize that this is valuable and essential work for effectively um, doing science with a community and, and for a community. This was a little open house we had, and uh, this was storytelling at the end. We, we all sat around and shared stories about our time in the Arctic. Um, so there's a, a movie called On the Ice, um, the Ikaibik Sukukun story. I, I should have put a link at the end of the presentation, but um, I'll share that in the chat window uh, later. Um, so, so that was what the, that's how our project began. And for me, that was a unique experience. I'd never had a project where we literally were allowed to start without any questions and, and, and build them up from there. Um, and so at the end of the first year, we had six questions that were vetted through a, a back and forth process between the science team and the, our Indigenous Advisory Council. Um, <laughs> the numbering is weird. Uh, uh, it starts at zero for reasons I won't go into now, but the first question was what species of marine mammal and birds occupied the lead system west of Kotzebue Sound prior to breakup? And this really was prompted by uh, the interest among the community members. What would they do if they had some drones and they could launch them out over the sea? This is the first thing they wanted to know. This was a, an area that is essentially blind for them. It's a very difficult area to reach on foot or by boat. And so it represented a knowledge gap and, and they wanted to be able to look at that. Um, what controls how marine mammals use Kotzebue Sound? Uh, what controls specifically how long the length of the bearded seal hunting season is in Kotzebue Sound? That's the single most important uh, marine mammal subsistence resource for, for people in Kotzebue. Um, what determines ice transport processes in Kotzebue Sound? Um, some of the elders were really concerned about sediment transport and how that affects uh, coastal erosion uh, around Kotzebue. What snow and ice surface properties promote uh, good dens for ring seals? Um, and what role does sea ice play in sediment transport and deposition as actually related to the ice transport question? Um, we added a new question at the end of all this after our first year of field work, which was, why was there so little sea ice in Kotzebue Sound in 2018 and 2019? It turns out that our two main years of field work were, were very anomalous in this region, and, and we sort of had to add an extra question that addressed the, that aspect specifically. Um, in this talk, I'm going to be addressing these three questions that we were able to um, uh, address, I think, quantitatively and, and, and in some cases with some really new insights. So to provide that historical context that I mentioned about 2018, 2019, um, these are mean monthly sea ice concentrations within Kotzebue Sound for the months of May, June, and July. And what you can really see here is that toward the end of this period, which, which actually ends in 2018, um, May is starting to look like what June used to look like and June is starting to look like what July used to look like and July um, is starting to really look, 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 look like it's never looked before. Um, and so it turned out our field work ended up taking place in these two highly anomalous years um, and we constantly found ourselves asking the question like uh, that you know, how, how can you learn about stuff that has no precedent? Um, to give some information about how bearded seal hunting season, uh, how, how bearded seal hunting works in Kotzebue Sound, um, the bearded seals like to occupy uh, the loose drifting ice where they can get in and out of the water with, with relative ease. Um, but that ice is not accessible until after the landfast ice near Kotzebue breaks up. And one of the things that happens in the season is that there's a river channel that funnels the, the flow from three major river systems in the area. And that water all empties out past Kotzebue and create, cuts this channel through, through the, the land fast ice here. And once that channel is reliably open and, and isn't at risk of getting plugged up again, 
then uh, hunters can go out in their boats and look for bearded seals. And they can look for them as long as the ice lasts. So on the left is kind of what makes the, what, what, what signals the start of the bearded seal hunting season. The habitat for the bearded seals is accessible for hunters from Kotzebue. And the right hand image shows uh, basically what happens at the end of the season when the ice is too far away and too difficult to find. Um, and and the, the, the seals really are associated with that ice. So they're difficult to hunt if there isn't ice around. Um, what we found uh, using journals from one of our local partners, Alex Whiting, uh, who's a scientist with the native village of Kotzebue, is that there's been quite a lot of variability um, over the years in, in the, the timing and duration of the bearded seal hunt. Um, it, in the last decade, there's been a marked decline, and the 2019 season was the uh, earliest to open and the earliest to close and the shortest uh, season um, since he'd been keeping records. Looking at satellite data, um, uh, oh sorry, this isn't looking at satellite data, because this is, uh, yes, looking at satellite data to try and figure out based on the images when the channel is open, we found a very strong correlation between when the season starts according to the journal and when that channel is visible in the satellite imagery. Uh, switching species to looking at uh, ringed seals now, these are not such an important prey species, a uh, subsistence species for, for hunters in Kotzebue Sound now, but historically they were, and there's many people who still hunt them as much for cultural reasons as for uh, nutrition. Um, uh, ringed seals are uniquely adapted to occupy land fast ice. They can create and maintain holes in the ice that allows them to go in and out of the water without requiring uh, natural openings in the ice cracks and, and leads between the ice flows. Um, and so ring seals generally are found associated with, with land fast ice. Um, but one concern recently is that the snow depth recently hasn't been as deep in this region and the ring seals need a certain amount of snow to build a layer uh, so that they can keep their pups warm and protect them from predators during what is a fairly lengthy pupping season uh, for um, uh, marine marine mammals. R ring seals have a somewhat longer pupping season than other marine mammals. And what we found is that um, seals tend to be found where the snow is deepest, and the snow is deepest tends to be deepest where there are ridges on the ice. And if you look at a late season satellite image, late into the melt season, you can see those snow, where the snow patches are lingering, where the ice is brightest, that corresponds to where the uh, snow was deepest earlier in the season. Um, and we're able to use that to actually produce a uh, predictive map of habitat quality and actually uh, associate that with expected ring seal concentrations. Um, uh, th this is that map. The elders of our advisory council looked at it um, and felt that it accurately captured where they had found uh, ring seals that year. And so this, this could be an important management tool in the future. We also deployed um, uh, a, a mass balance station for, for measuring ice thickness and, and melt and growth of the ice and ocean making oceanographic measurements underneath the ice. Um, the whole list of things that we, we measured there on the left, I, I won't read them out. Um, and, and this allowed us to look at how the ice and snow depth, ice thickness and snow depth changed over the course of both the 2018 season um, when it stopped growing in mid-February. So the sea ice actually reached an equilibrium ice thickness in mid-February, which was not expected. Um, and in 2019, when uh, it actually basically started melting in, in mid-February, um, and uh, that was uh, somewhat even less expected. Sorry. The zoom, uh, the zoom paraphernalia blocking part of my screen, so I can't see all of the text on the screen here, but um, we also saw substantial flooding of the snow 
in 2019 associated with a somewhat unusually large snow depth and thin ice. Um, we made a, a, a simple one-dimensional growth model that included uh, snow ice formation. Um, and using this, we were able to derive an estimate of the heat flux under the ice as, as a residual, effectively, the, the difference between what our model predicted for ice growth and what we observed, we assumed that that um, was explained by a, a heat flux coming from the ocean that we, we weren't able to measure. And we did that for 2018, and we found ocean heat fluxes on the order of 10 watts per meter squared. Um, and, and we saw some flooding in, in, in 2018 as well. We did it in 2019 too. Um, which you remember we saw the ice not only sort of stop growing in February, but start thinning again. Um, and then we calculated substantially higher ocean heat fluxes. Um, and by looking at data from the under ice mooring, we found that the deviations from the freezing point, which is what's uh, significant when we're actually thinking about what can actually melt the ice, were associated with pulses of saltier water. And from this, we concluded that the heat driving the uh, uh, melting of the ice was driven by uh, ocean heat rather than heat coming down uh, the river from upstream. Um, and to sort of try and assess how common or how unusual we think these circumstances were, we ran our model over a wide variety of different snow depth and uh, ocean heat flux scenarios. Um, and we found it basically very difficult to ever create a, a situation that would have resulted in thinner ice than we observed in, in 2019. So we, we think that 2019 was likely the, the thinnest ice um, that has been seen certainly uh, since at least our air temperature record goes back, which is 1946. Um, for reference, Cotsbury Elders um, report that the ice used to be at least four feet, 1.2 meters thick in this region, which is substantially thicker than, than we saw. So to go back to our three questions that we thought we would be able to answer with, with this approach. Question two, what environmental factors control the length? Of the bearded seal hunting and season cuts view sound. We confirmed that the breakup of the channel is a, a large part of what controls the start of the bearded seal hunting season. We showed with our mass balance measurements that uh, the channel is thinned by bottom melt from heat below, and the ocean is the primary source of that heat. So, as more heat is able to make it from the North Pacific into the cuts view sound region, we suspect that the bearded seal hunting season will continue to start earlier. The, the channel will be, become accessible earlier. Question four was what snow and ice surface properties promote ring seal den integrity and pupping success? And by the way, these were, were questions that were largely designed by the scientists, not so much the indigenous members, but they would uh, uh, wordsmith with us and, and be very specific about the words that they wanted included in these questions. Um, so we found that seals preferentially were found around deep snow associated with ridges in the ice, but where we found deep snow on thin ice, um, we found flooding, which is unlikely to be beneficial for ring seals. And in fact, this photograph uh, in the background is a flooded ring seal layer that we found um, that was, was abandoned at, at, a, at a time earlier than we would expect lit ring seal layers to be abandoned. And lastly, why was there so little sea ice in Cotsby Sound in 2018 2019? Uh, we showed that the heat from the ocean slowed ice growth, and in the case of 2019, actually promoted ice melt in, in the middle of winter when we normally expect the ice to be growing still. Um, and uh, other research has shown that this heat was likely residual heat left over from the summer that uh, wasn't fully released to the atmosphere during the uh, freeze up process. Um, and I should have put a, a link here to the Ikebik Sukukin video, um, but uh, let me 
come come back to it. You can see my video. Um, uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, I'm I'm certainly happy to ask them. I uh, tried to go through a lot of material there quite quickly in 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 the interest of time. Great. Thanks so much, Andy. I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, we'll open it up to any questions. Yeah, Alec. Yeah, I maybe missed at the beginning, like how that community was chosen and how relevant <laughs> the questions are that you came up with and the approach you came up with would be to other communities in the Arctic. Uh, that's, yeah, that's a great question, Alec. Um, it's very difficult to do this type of question without any, like just completely from scratch. And so Kotzebue was a community where I had started to build some relationships. Um, and in particular, um, I'd started working with uh, Alex Whiting, who's a, a environmental scientist with the native village of Kotzebue, that's the tribal organization. Um, which for those not, not familiar with, with uh, the US, that is the sovereign entity that owns the, the, the land um, in, in that region. They have a government to government relationship with the US federal government. Uh, Alex Whiting is an environmental scientist with that tribe and not many other tribal organizations in the Arctic have someone who has that position. So, so that sort of singled out that uh, to, to start with. Um, that's, I think, why we focused on Kotsby, but also Kotsby really hadn't received as much attention. I think these questions were a lot more novel because we um, uh, decided to take them on in, in Kotsby. Interesting. Uh, any other questions? Well, yeah, I maybe add another course. Oh, it looks like someone else's hand. Please go. <laughs> okay, uh, Aurora. Yeah, hi, Andy. Thanks so much for the presentation. Kind of related to Alex's question, um, can you talk a little bit about the funding structure that allowed you to be able to start this project and create the questions um, sort of like, instead of like writing a proposal with these questions all um, fleshed out beforehand? Um, yeah, so um, uh, the, the, the project was funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, who obviously have a very different set of criteria by, by which they choose projects. And one of their criteria um, is that they will only fund research that couldn't otherwise be funded by NSF or NASA or National Institutes for Health or, or some of the other big funding agencies here in the US. Um, and so they had actually sort of internally come up with a bit of a recipe themselves. They wanted something that involved the Arctic communities and drones. And so, so this started with some preconception from the Moore Foundation. That sort of, uh, and they brought me together with Chris Sapper, who was the, um, the lead PI from Columbia University, who's done a lot of work with drones in the Arctic. And I said to the uh, more foundations, I, I can't speak for the community. We, we can't put questions down on a page. And they said, great, we'll fly you to Cotsview and you can meet with people and you can put you can put some starting questions in your proposal. And that floored me. That was even before submitting a pro proposal, the Moore Foundation was willing to cover some travel costs so that we could write a better proposal. Um, so, so at that meeting, we identified some themes and, and that sort of made allowed us to sort of get together the the group of scientists we thought would be needed to address those themes. Um, and they were very broad. They were sea ice and mammals, uh, the, the ocean under the ice and, and things like that. Um, and then we had a team of four or five scientists and we matched that with four indigenous experts plus Alex. Alex Whiting from the native village of Kotzebue. And in our first year, that was when we started with the blank whiteboard and started with the question, what would you do, uh, this is to the um, advisory council, what would you do if you had these resources and what questions would you ask? And, and that was our starting point. Interesting. 
that's a really interesting process, Andy. Um, I know in Canada, that's always a bit of a, a bit of a speed bump sometimes to get projects started is talking to communities and getting their input and making sure that it's the questions are developed in a mutual mutually beneficial and interesting way and not just scientists coming in and saying here are questions. Uh, so that's great that you guys were afforded that opportunity. Uh, Marin. Hi Andy, thanks for that talk. I'm curious about your ocean heat flux. Um, because like you, you saw these sharp pulses of um, higher temperature and higher salinity, is that um, upwelling driven by the river flow and mixing? Is that um, water that's coming from off the shelf? Um, where, where does that higher salinity water come from? Uh, yeah, and I, I should have uh, perhaps in a little bit more explanation of the, the sort of environment this is. Uh, so Cogsby Sound is like a very big estuary, or certainly the, 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 the near land part of the, the Cogsby Sound where we were looking at. And so the, the strong pulses in salt content, and, and I also should clarify the, the temperature goes down when the salt water comes in, mm -hmm. but it, the, the difference from the freezing point is greater. So um, even though the salt water is colder, it has a greater potential to, to melt because it's farther above its freezing point. Um, that's driven by uh, inflow and outflow which is largely driven by winds. The, the Arctic is, is mostly a microtidal environment where diurnal tides are perhaps five or 10 centimeters, but the wind-driven changes in water level might be up to a meter. And, and so those big spikes are sort of on the synoptic timescale. And so uh, it, it's the wind pushing the water around and the, there's a large body of fresh water behind Kotzebue that um, exchanges water uh, up and down with, with Kotzebue Sound and you get salt water and fresh water flowing back and forth. Thank you. Yeah, Roger. Thanks. C kind of leading on from what Marin just asked, do, do you know from the elders how stable the position of that channel is, if, if it's so critical in the, in the uh, sort of seasonal evolution there? Is it always nicely in the same place because of some, because of the bathymetry there, or, or do the, the those different bodies of water behind make different areas develop and so on? Um, that, that's a great question, and, and that was part of their uh, the reason for understanding sediment transport um, in the area. Although that wasn't a question ultimately, that our the field program we were able to carry out, we we didn't address that question very directly. Um, that is part of their concern because the, the, the channels are really important for um, access to go hunting, but also for bringing goods and, and supplies into uh, Kotzebue. Um, uh, if, if, if that channel were to silt up, then they wouldn't be able to bring barges and things in to get uh, their annual sea lift. So the channel seems to be pretty stable and I'm getting a little bit outside my wheelhouse now, but I, I believe it actually dates back to a former sea level when that's actually where the river channel would have, would have been. Um, uh, but the shoals either side of it can shift around and, and at the, the outlet end of the channel, I think that can vary a, a bit from time, for, from year to year. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, there must be so much that we we ought to recall from the elders in all these communities everywhere just to get our um, get our proper landscape together. That's great. Thanks. Great. Uh, so, yeah, one more time. Thank you to Andy, Sean and Anton for the great talks today. Uh, this was all recorded and will be posted to the IGS YouTube page, I believe, tomorrow. Uh, again, the IGS YouTube page has a has all of these talks recorded. So if you ever want to go back and rewatch a talk, they're all available there. Um, I'll also plug next week we are back to glaciology talks. The speaker, Levan, is unsure if they're going to be able to talk. Um, so pay attention to Cryolist or Twitter to see to see what ends up happening next week. But there's a chance we'll have a talk. There's also a chance we may not have a talk next week. Uh, Andy. Yeah, I'd just like to point out that sea ice does still come under the topic of glaciology. So to say that we're back to glaciology is... Yeah, that's um, true. Okay. 
Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now. We are, we are in the IGS uh, symposium. So there we go. Alec gives the thumbs down. <laughs> uh, but speaking of sea ice, the next sea ice talks are going to be March 15th. Uh, we're going to stick with this Arctic-Antarctic combination. So we have Mark Serez from the NSIDC giving a talk on sort of the future outlook of, of Arctic sea ice and a warming climate. And then we have Phil Reed from the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, who is going to give a sort of a similar overview look towards Antarctic sea ice, which is, of course, in the news a lot these days as Antarctic sea ice has fallen to its record minimum. Uh, I just also wanted to note that because we're in the IGS seminar series, uh, abstracts for the IGS sea ice symposium, which are being held this June in Bremerhaven at Avi, uh, have all been submitted now and have all been organized and arranged. I've uh, been getting a series of emails today looking to schedule uh, talk orders and things like that. So pay attention to your email. There should be something out in early to mid-March with some more information there. Uh, but in the meantime, I'd encourage you to check out the IGS website for more information on that meeting. Uh, so that's it for this week. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks for the great questions. And uh, again, awesome, awesome presentations. We'll see everyone uh, in a couple of weeks. Take care. Thanks, everyone.